Well, thanks very much, Dan, for inviting us to be here today and to Mark Baker and Ian Taylor for working with us and for this morning for giving us this very apt descriptor of healthcare as an operations management free zone. Very true, very frightening. We're going to tell you a little bit about our organization's lean journey over the last several years, and we've had the opportunity yesterday to talk at more length with our colleagues at uh, Huddersfield Calderdale, uh, healthcare colleagues from Tuscany, University of Michigan, and elsewhere. And everywhere the problems in healthcare are very similar, and I think we're learning that similar solutions can be effective. But as Dan mentioned, my institution is also an academic teaching center in the United States. And the economic and the political structure of our healthcare delivery system uh, is different in the United States than it is in the UK or Canada or Italy or even in Michigan. So we're all going to have to find specific solutions for our specific circumstances. We're all going to find that our efforts to improve the process of value creation is constrained to a larger or smaller degree by the fundamentals of how these complex systems are structured and the degree to which the economic incentives of the various stakeholders are aligned or misaligned. Those of us in leadership positions in healthcare have a broader responsibility, I think, to tackle these larger social and economic issues since their resolution is critical to improve performance and value creation. So if you look at the facts and figures here, you see that on the, in terms of scope and scale, we're, not, we're more or less like Huddersfield, a sort of medium big hospital. Um, I think, as Dan mentioned, the, only, the, 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 the salient key difference is that we're a pretty large teaching and research center. On the teaching side, that means that care is provided through a combination of 900 faculty physicians who provide care at the hospital on a full-time basis. Um, and we have about a thousand trainees that pass through our doors every year um, in various kinds of training programs. M very many of those are on award on a three-week rotation. So every three weeks they turn over and there's a lot of turnover in the care provision team. Um, of that $1.6 billion in gross revenue, about $250 million of that is uh, bench science funding that comes to us from the federal government. We're the number three largest hospital recipient of basic science research funds in the United States, uh, and the number one, two, four, and five are across the street from us in Boston, so it's kind of a crowded environment. So we have a little bit of a cost problem in the United States of America. From 2000 to 2007, and I can assure you the trend hasn't gotten any better, uh, you can see that wages are up about 24%. The cost of family health care insurance, up 91%. And this is the one that really mystifies me. The cost of administering commercial health care is up 109%. Whenever I see this graph, it looks to me like the escalation of housing prices over the last few years, and we know how that ended. So this is the cost curve that everybody in the United States talks about trying to bend uh, and if you look at the 2011 number, you can see that sometime over the next six years, uh, if left to our own devices, we'll figure out a way to increase the cost of health care in the United States by about another 50%. Now, it would be great to report, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is, uh, I can tell you from my own personal experience, having a bit of involvement in municipal government uh, in the community where I live, the cost of health care is crowding out funds for education and infrastructure in municipal and state and federal government all across the United States. This is us compared to other advanced countries. Now, it would be great to report that health care in the U.S. costs twice as much as any other advanced country, but our outcomes are twice as good and our population is much healthier and the burden of disease is half in these other countries. But none of these things are true. We simply spend twice as much per capita for poorer results. Now, I, my belief is that U.S. costs and outcomes are such an outlier because our economic incentives in the U.S. system are much more profoundly misaligned than elsewhere in the, in the advanced world. That's a topic for another day. Talk a little bit about the state in which we live. We are the highest cost per capita in the country in the country that is the most expensive in the world, and eastern Massachusetts and Boston is the most expensive part of our state. And while my hospital is not the most expensive in the state, and I'll show you a little bit more about that, 
um, we're right up there. We're at the apex of the cost curve, I would say, worldwide. We're beginning to experiment with various alternative methods of payment. We're, I think we're pleased with ourselves in Massachusetts that five years ago we passed a universal access law. So we now have the highest fraction of our population in the United States that is provided with some form of health insurance. It's about 98 or 98 and a half percent. Um, and that's a really good thing. Uh, but now we really have to tackle the cost problem. And a lot of changes are going on in the market. I think as many of you know, we have a mixed governmental and private market on the provider and the insurer side in the United States of America. Um, and that market is very much in motion, um, uh, driven by the need to contain costs, driven by payment reform. One of the very interesting developments is we now see the entry of private equity into the Massachusetts hospital market in a major way, an investment of some $900 million to acquire a struggling chain of community hospitals, and they've now acquired many more. Uh, so there's about 11 hospitals that have been acquired by a for-profit. That's a new development in the Massachusetts marketplace. As I mentioned, it's a mixed public-private payment system. Um, about half of the business that we do in my hospital is paid for by government programs. Medicare is the federal program for the elderly. Medicaid is the jointly funded state and federal program for the indigent. Um, the dirty little reality is that we lose money on Medicare and we lose even more money on Medicaid. So there's 50% of our book of business is a loss leader for us. And Medicaid, the program for the indigent, for my hospital covers about 70% of our cost. Um, but we have both a, a moral and a legal obligation to serve those patients. We cannot withdraw for economic reasons. What that means in reality is that there's a fairly substantial cost shift of the cost of providing health care to those patients from the government to those who are insured by commercial insurance. That drives the cost of commercial insurance up for the employed population who are provided health care insurance by their employees. And as you can see, we're the one of the slowest growing states in the United States. Population is getting smaller. We're just losing a congressional seat in the next uh, upcoming uh, redistricting. So there's no growth opportunity in a larger population. There's going to be, we think, the potential for some increased utilization as some of us get older, fatter, and sicker. Um, but that's really taking share from one to the other. I think the way I look at, at the situation that we're facing in our state is we've run a big experiment in deregulation of the commercial insurance market in the last 20 years. And the result has been a fairly disastrous consolidation of providers, uh, huge market share uh, by one or two providers, and they have gained the ability to skew the reimbursement system. So the Attorney General uh, of the Commonwealth a couple of years ago started to look at this. On the left-hand side are hospital costs, um, and the red bar is my hospital, and those are all of our competitors arrayed on one side or the other, and you see the vertical axis is median. We're just slightly above median in the state, but the range is 0.75 to 0.19 or something. This is reimbursement rates that hospitals get from commercial insurers. And on the right-hand side, you see something similar for physician rates uh, that who are paid separately under the commercially negotiated insurance contracts, even a bigger disparity of slightly less than 1 to 3.2. Now, the key finding of this report was there was no correlation with severity. There was no correlation with geography. There was no correlation with status as an academic or community hospital. It's only correlated by the degree of leverage that the institutions or the physicians had in the commercial insurance negotiating market. So a very skewed system. So key challenges that we think about, obviously a complex system. For us as an academic medical center, we do clinical care, we do teaching and research. Uh, we lose money on research and we lose money on teaching and so they are cross-subsidized from clinical revenue, which is now going to decline. And on the research side, we, we believe that funding from the federal government is going to be flat to actually negative in real terms. So the financial model of the academic medical center in the United States is going to be on, under unprecedented stress. We talk about physician hospital alignment, I think perhaps unique in the United States and certainly in my institution. 
the physicians don't work for the hospital. They work for a separate corporation. They send separate billings. They are economically um, disaligned from the hospital, and they have their own, their own incentive structure. And I think that produces a variety of bizarre consequences. Uh, limited resources, the average operating margin of a hospital in Massachusetts now is about a percent and a half. Um, and that's inadequate to allow us to fund depreciation. Um, so most of the hospitals were actually, because of the disparities in payment between big hospitals and small hospitals, we actually think that over the last 20 years we've systematically decapitalized those smaller community-based institutions that ought to be in the best position to provide cost-effective care. So we have wonderful goals. Um, but I think if we're honest with ourselves, we have to admit that American academic medical centers, as they're now structured, they don't mainly, they're not mainly structured to create value for the patient. We're sort of slaves to the innovator's dilemma and to our legacy ways of creating value for physicians, for hospital management, for the institutions themselves, both the sustenance of the bricks and mortar and for the social and reputational entity that these hospitals represent. We've thought last about creating value for the customer, our patient. Instead, we've created economic and organizational forms that make it almost impossible to put that first. As I mentioned, separate professional facility buildings, separate corporations, lack of alignment. So we've got a lot to do. And improving the way we do our work, uh, the way in which the work is organized, and finding ways to get waste out of the system is very much key to our plan for success. Alice will tell you about that. Depressed. I'm depressed. Okay. Well, let's talk about what we're doing. Um, that's pretty daunting, right? So we come from a daunting industry and a daunting marketplace. I'm not sure the combination could be uh, more difficult, but I'm lucky I work with Eric because we want to actually make a difference. And so let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing. And thank you to my Huddersfield Caldwell friends for giving a little bit of the backdrop so I don't have to go into that level of detail. But, you know, what is business transformation? And so about seven years ago, uh, the CEO at that time uh, asked, he, came, he was our first CEO, I think, from outside uh, healthcare. And I think he was really struck by the lack that the operation uh, management free zone that we operate in and said, is anybody looking at the processes? And I think tag, I was it, right? I was an IS at the time. Um, and I said, I'll do it if we call it business transformation. I'm only interested if we're really going to make a difference, really transform the way we look at work and deliver care to our patients, not just process improvement. So I struck that deal, and uh, this is the purpose statement um, that I drafted. And there's three constants year to year. We're seven years old, we're seven years young. Um, and every year we focus on these three things, innovation, diffusion, and systems. And what does that mean? So for innovation, what's really important, I think in healthcare, I mean, it's just, you, if you have not walked through a healthcare organization, I'm inviting you. Um, I think you need to come and see to understand how chaotic and how not designed it is but we really want folks to understand what the problems are. You, can, you know, I always say to my teams, go beyond the problem edges. What do you think the edges of the problem are? It goes far beyond that, right? So meeting folks like Jim Womack and Dan Jones and John Shook and others really energized me to start to think about seeing the whole, thinking about big pieces, right? So I start to think about innovating in terms of our problem solving. As far as diffusion, how do you get this thinking to 10,000 people in the organization when a couple of thousand of them are physicians and they don't report to the hospital, right? So all you have is your considerable charm and influence, literally. You have nothing else going for you. You have to figure out, how do I touch those people in a way that get them to understand why this is important and how they should look at their work and perform differently? And so start to think about bringing those two together. You know, they're misaligned, as Eric said. How do we bring the hospital people and the physician organization together and learn together and think about the diffusion as a team. And of course, the systems. We're thinking about work and management systems. Think about everything holistically, how you solve problems. And so really introduce the concept of systems thinking in the hospital. 
So just a quick bit of history. So I started the research in the end of 2004, and in 2005, probably like many of you, you had to think about quick wins, right? Nobody even knew what this was uh, in healthcare. It was completely foreign. And there weren't a lot of people to follow back then, which I think in retrospect was really lucky because I think healthcare folks love best practices, right? We always think it's great to find a best practice and, and adopt it. And we're really pushing for adaptability. Get the great ideas, figure out what your problem is, and uh, implement it. So in 2005, we had this problem where we have this cyber knife. And what a cyber knife is, is as I understand it, I'm not a physician, but um, it allows you to uh, um, get at tumors that are inoperable. All right, so you have a tumor in your spine, for instance, can't operate, too dangerous, or your brain. And this, with coordinates, you need physicists to figure out how to figure out where that and zap it. All right, what was the problem we had? We could only get two to three patients through a day. And at that time, we had the only cyber knife in the Northeast coast. Again, as I understand it from my radiation oncologist, and they wanted to get five patients through. So this was a life-saving measure, potentially. This was really important to the organization, uh, never mind the cost in putting something like this in. And so we just did a very simple exercise with one of my manufacturing friends. I had to make friends with manufacturing folks who would come in and they're fascinated and say, let's just ask the question, why can't you do five? And that's all we did. And then you tackle all those, right? You Pareto, you saw. I thought, this is really easy. But that started the belief system for all those clinicians in that team to say, I will do more. So that's how we got started. In 2006, we started thinking a little broader, and you know, I tend to be fairly ambitious, um, and said, let's tackle some unsolvable problems. And so, I don't know about Dr. Jarvis, but in our emergency room, uh, we have this long-standing problem of uh, defects in our blood samples that were collected, where uh, one in four were defects, meaning that it added another hour to your stay, that the blood was drawn and it was hemolyzed, essentially, could give you false positives. And these are for folks that potentially are having a heart attack. So again, a very important point. But the chief of the emergency room said, why the heck would you look at this? This has been a problem for 30 years. It's not solvable. So I love a challenge. So I said, okay, let's study that. And essentially, I mean, the, the, the countermeasures don't matter that much, but it was really just going to see, studying the work, breaking it down, understanding lots of variation, and coming up with a standard. And it was very simple to do, having the nurses um, understand their work and immediately stabilize the work and brought it down to a normal level of defect, same as the rest of the hospital. So we could just plug along like this. Honestly, people were happy. They thought, oh, lean works. This is great. Um, but frankly, I wasn't satisfied, right? And started wondering, there's got to be more than this because the place is huge and there were a lot of problems and we could keep doing that. But, you know, I wasn't interested in hiring 20, 40 more engineers. That's not what I was interested in doing. And so we started to say, well, how do we engage everybody to own this journey? It, it can't be, as Jim Womack said this morning, be delegated to a program <laughs> office, right? So created a course, um, a curriculum, a series, if you will, weekly, eight weeks, six hours a week. So this is, this is a huge ask, 48 hours of learning together for our physician leaders, the chairs of the department, or chiefs, we call them chiefs, um, so you can understand the culture already, right? And our vice presidents in C-suite all took the class together, not required, I asked, and at the time, the CEO said to me, oh, I think you're nuts. I don't think anybody's, nobody's coming. Everybody came and created it in a way that created some demand by saying, I can only fit 12 people in a class. So if you don't get in this one, you'll have to wait two to three months. And so at this point, about 95% of our senior leaders have gone through it. Changed the language of improvement in the organization, literally. And everybody now was on the same pl level playing field, and we were able to talk. So the woman in glasses, is, she's actually my cyber knife uh, um, chief of radiation oncology, Dr. Stevenson. Behind her is our senior vice president of development or fundraising. And that's just like incongruous, those two people studying a shortage of antibiotic with a pharmacist in the pharmacy. But that's the kind of thing that was happening every week as part of the class. They had to go see. They had homework. It was very humbling. But it really was a game changer for us. 
and the point was to own the journey, three legs to the stool of the course, uh, where we taught philosophy first, why is this journey important, to get everyone to understand why before how, because everybody was saying, well, how do we do this? How do we get lean? And before we did that, we said, let's spend a couple of weeks talking about the philosophy, the history, um, understand where this came from, and then we talked about management, leader's role in a lean environment, a management system, if you will, and before we went to countermeasures or tools the last two weeks. In 2010, we started to tackle the way we plan. And so this is clumsy, but I was really happy with this, right? I think we already had a pretty good planning process, um, three to five pages, you know, but it was a Word document, it was sequential, and you couldn't really see the relationships. So it was, still, it was okay. But the challenge in 2010 that we put forth to the leadership team was can we figure out a plan on a page. Now, the font's kind of small. We have too many things. There's still silos, but I was still happy. It was the first step um, for us in trying to integrate the three missions that Eric talked about, right, clinical care research um, and teaching, and also moving away from individual leaders developing plans into developing a plan together. So now what? What are we going to do next, right? Um, I wonder a lot about the constraints in healthcare. We have physical constraints. Our buildings are, I don't know, they're ancient. They're 100, well, not compared to the UK. Fair enough, but <laughs> they feel old to me. Um, it's really hard to work around our spaces. So just physical flow is really hard. We have our org structure is a constraint. The, the physicians and the hospital are in two different uh, organizations. We have a lot of constraints, right? And we still aren't great at seeing the whole. I mean, we, we're aware of that at least, so at least we now know there's a problem. But also our resources, right? Whether we, we're still very accustomed to saying, I need more people, I need more space, and we're still doing that equipment. All of these resources, as Eric said, we have limited resources. And so, you know, we're thinking about this, and that's when um, um, Dan came into my life, right? Um, I, I saw the book uh, Making Hospitals Work at LEI in Cambridge, so we're lucky because they're just across the river from us, and I saw one copy there, and I thought, what is this? There's a book about hospitals, and I read it end to end. It was a little mysterious, a lot of English stuff in there, but I thought this could probably work, right, if, if I had a translator. Um, and so <laughs> Dan came and did some translation, and he walked the gamba and said, oh, wow, it's pretty chaotic here. Um, we started to do what... Um, um, Huddersfield did, right, the, the Foundation Trust. We knew that we knew how many patients were trying to get into the emergency room. Same story, but we didn't know how many people were trying to get out, and we were clogged up there. And so we thought about this as a closed-loop system, started to understand at a glance, same thing, visual hospital. Uh, we have five hospitals up. We're, we're about a um, few months behind um, what they're doing, but I'm really excited by the results because I feel like we're definitely getting there. And the second piece was plan for every patient. So it's pretty scary to think that you come into a hospital and previously there wasn't a coordinated plan. There were individual plans. Our nurses had a plan, our physicians had a plan, social work had a plan, and so on. But there wasn't really a master plan for your care to make sure you get to the medically fit to leave point. So that's what number two was. How do we create a plan uh, the morning after you were discharged? Most of our uh, admissions come in in the middle of the night uh, and get them a plan and then measure that and see how close were we? What's preventing you from doing some of these things? The next thing we're doing, and we've started this, is how do we start aligning our support services to need or demand, right? So if our patients need these things outlined in the plan, what's preventing you from getting that, whether it's physiotherapy or a certain medication? And so that allows us to start to track those delays and work on those. And so at this point, we're experimenting by having a pharmacist on one of the inpatient units, and immediately we found in the first month, instead of 20 to 50 uh, interventions the pharmacy normally makes because they're not dedicated to floors on this one unit, he made 400 plus interventions and some of them were pretty serious. So that gave us some information on some of the safety issues that we could prevent by starting to understand alignment of services. Problem solving, of course, is happening because Tanya calls them uh, stones, I call them boulders, they seem pretty big, but it's a, at least the problem is ugly, right? All these problems are floating out and then 
very importantly, creating a measurement system that not just measures the outcomes, the results are very important to us, but also the process so that problem solving can occur. How do you know when your process is healthy or sick? And then balancing measures to know that you're not breaking something else, right? So if we have a length of stay that's too short, we don't want our patients to come back, right? Because we didn't do our job well. So we want to measure readmissions, for instance, as a balancing measure. So is there such a thing as a path to transformation, right? So this question dogs me all the time. I'm reminded seven years ago when I was so arrogantly said, well, I'll, I'll do it if I'm called business transformation. But is there such a thing? Um, and I remember someone saying to me once, you know, you just have to have a tortoise mentality. This isn't a race. Um, this, it's not even sure there's a roadmap. Uh, you actually have to think about what your personal journey is, your organization's journey, and just figure that out, maybe day at a time. All right, so Eric talked about some of the challenges we had in this, these headlines. What's happening is that these very traditional approaches, right, whether you want to call it rationing or cost cutting, very traditional approaches right now in healthcare to limit costs, right? And this is what we're facing, whether it's limiting stays or looking at the insurance cost curve, what are we going to do, right? So what do we do if we can't predict what's happening in the future? And I think that's the question. Um, so I'll tell you what I'm going to do, and you can tell me if um, this makes sense or not. Uh, I think the paradigm has shifted so much since I started working in healthcare about how we think about improvement. We have to look at patients across the continuum, not just as inpatients, not just as outpatients or emergency patients. I love that Tanya's doing all those value stream um, maps for all of these paths, but how do we look at all of these together? Because patients don't stay in one or two of those. They criss and cross, right? So we understand the care. We have to focus on efficiency. So we have a new CEO who started, mm, I guess it's three weeks now, and this was in his morning first day email. He talked about these things, right? And high quality, high value provider. We're already known as that uh, in our state, which is nice, but how do we continue to push that and not get too complacent? So this is what we'd like to do. Starting to think about maybe the key is just to be flexible and agile because you can't predict the future. And that means flexible and agile in everything, whether it's our processes, how we run the business, maybe we need some management science, right? The infrastructure, because all of it's man-made, so it must be solvable. That's how I look at it. The workforce, and you know, does it make sense to have people work Monday through Friday from this hour to, I mean, we're a hospital, we're 365 days a year, round the clock. But if you come in on certain shifts in our hospital, there's not a lot of management. Right? It's all staff. And so we, we think about those things as that creates stability and allow our staff to be supported in problem solving. Um, the leadership piece, which seems to be a theme for this conference, so that's pretty exciting. And now we're starting to talk about what about our suppliers and our vendors and our partners, the universities, because we're a teaching hospital. All of these other folks that influence and touch us um, as we try to deliver in our business. The bottom line, uh, and, and, and what I say to folks is first you have to see the problems, right? Uncover those stones or boulders so that you can solve them and then share and teach others. It's, it's that simple. And so everything, whether it's those constants, innovation, diffusion, or systems, or the unknown future, everything kind of comes back to those basics. And again, the purpose statement, I'm going to highlight those pieces, survive and thrive when you don't know what's coming around the corner. I think that's that's what we're thinking about mostly right now. All right, thank you.